So in today's class, we're going to <laughs> we are going to meet, and we're going to try to paint a picture through his names, through his writings, and through some of his ideas of the wisest of all men of King Solomon, known in Hebrew as Shlomo, Shlomo HaMelech. And first I would like to tell you that there are three primary works that King Solomon wrote. The first one is known as Shir HaShirim, the Song of Songs. It's a beautiful love poem, a love song, and it's written between man and woman, which is probably the paradigm of love. But it really is an allegory for the love that exists between God and the Jewish people. And each verse there is more floral and more beautiful than the next. And they describe that all the books of the Tanakh are considered to be holy works written with divine inspiration. But they see that book, the Song of Songs, is called in the Talmud as the Holy of Holies. There's something very special about the love that exists between God and the Jewish people. Another work of King Solomon's is known as Mishlei. In English it will be called Proverbs. And it's full of metaphors, of, of, of ideas and concepts that you take them on one level, they mean something very simple. When you take them on another level, there's a lot of depth, tremendous depth there. I'll give you one such example of, of a verse from the book of Mishlei of Proverbs. There it states that when you raise children, Chanoch Lina'ar, when you are educating a child, it shall be done al pi darko, according to his path. Now that means simply you should educate children in a good way. But when you take that phrase deeper, what it's telling you is not all children are meant to be educated, are meant to be taught in the same way. We don't create a mold for our children and then force them into the mold. We allow them to flourish and to develop their skills and their talents that is unique and individual to each of those children. I remember back in the days when I was dating my, my wife, I sat down with my in-laws and they weren't my in-laws at the time, but they definitely wanted to meet the young man who was getting seriously involved with their daughter. They wanted to have a chance to talk with me and see what I was about, to see if they approved. Thankfully they did. And um, my father-in-law sat me down on the couch and he said to me, you know, Chaim, the way I raise my children is kind of like a flower in a flower pot. I let them grow and develop into ways that they chose fit. I didn't force any one path upon them. And there's a lot of diversity, actually, in my wife's family. She has a sister who's a CEO. She has a brother who's a scholar, another one who's a physicist. And that is a way to raise a child. And that comes from the work of King Solomon known as Proverbs. In that book, though, he tries to chart for us a course in life, a path, how to live an ethical and moral life that will gain us <coughs> eternal life, that will bring us into the next world where we can reap the rewards of our efforts and we could experience this incredible existence in the next world. So that's the path to eternal life. That's the book of Mishlei of Proverbs. The third book written by King Solomon is known as Koheles, or in English, Ecclesiastes. I actually see Koheles as the easier option of those two, because try spelling Ecclesiastes, right? <laughs> And their famous verse, you know, futile of futilities, all is futile. There he speaks of all the different obstacles and hurdles that may try to steer us off course on that road of eternal life that he sets for us in the book of Proverbs. All the temptations and allures that cause man to stray and, and meet their downfall. And that's what he does in the book of Ecclesiastes. So... There is some debate as to the chronological order. When were these three works of King Solomon written? Were they written throughout different stages of his life, or were they written the moment he became king over the Jewish people? But everyone agrees that in terms of sequence, which was first and which was last, the book of Ecclesiastes of Koheles was written last. That being said, I would like to take a moment to investigate. But can everyone still hear me? I want to make sure that everyone's able to hear me. Oh, yeah. Excellent. When I took a public speaking course, they said that when you speak to a group of people, you need to make sure that you feel that your voice can carry to the person sitting in the back of the room. So thank God the room here is not too large. We should be okay. Shlomo or Solomon had three names, and I would like to explore those with you, but just to tell you up front what the three names were. First of all, you, you have these on your, on your source sheet with bullet points. The three names of King Solomon. The first name was Shlomo or Solomon, that's his most famous name. But he was also known as Yedidya, or Jedidiah. And that name Jedidiah, therefore, or I had a friend, we called him Jed, 
for short, that comes from the biblical name Jedidiah, which was one of the names of <coughs> none other than King Solomon. And he's also known as Koheles. That's the name of one of his books. Ecclesiastes is known as Koheles. It's named after the author. And let's just explore for a few moments the history, the origin, perhaps the meanings behind those three names. Let's take a look at source one on our source sheet. This is the first verse in the book of Koheles. And it says, the words of Koheles, son of David, king in Jerusalem. And that's how we know that Solomon had this name Koheles. What does the name Koheles mean? <coughs> so I went to a school for elementary school from first through eighth grade in a part of New York known as Washington Heights. And it was what had once been known as Breuers of Germany. Um, it was the Yekisha school. And that's where I went. Um, ever since I went to that school, I have this really strong impulse to always be on time for things. I don't know what they did to me over there, but they convinced me you got to be on time. And I once said, when, uh, when things run, like I've, I've run different trips and events, when things run on time, I'm like a happy man, you know? And I, I suspect that there's some connection between my upbringing, being raised in this Breuer's German Yekish community, and my affinity towards things running on time. But the name of the synagogue that they had there was called the K-A-J Synagogue. And that stands for Kahal Adath Yishurun. The word Kahal, or Kahal, which is the root of the word Koheles, means to assemble, an assemblage, a congregation. Because Kahal, Koheles, means to assemble, to gather together. And the way they explain how that name pertains to King Solomon is in one of two ways. Either people would assemble, they would amass around King Solomon, who was known as the wisest of all men. And we're going to discover together the episode, how it came to pass that King Solomon got so wise. But because he was so wise, people appreciated that. And they would gather together around him in order to hear his wisdom. Kahal, they would assemble. Which, by the way, also tells you that King Solomon, being so wise, was not content. He wasn't just happy to keep that and hoard that wisdom for himself. He felt the need to share it with others. When you have a gift, especially a gift of wisdom, it doesn't cost you anything to give out some of that wisdom to share with others. It perhaps even strengthens it within you because, as our sages tell us, many of them have said, I've learned a good deal from my teachers, I've learned a lot from my colleagues, but I've learned most from my students quote from the uh, ethics of our fathers. So Solomon was driven to share that knowledge with all those who assembled and gathered around him. Another way of explaining the name Kohelas, the gathering, was that he gathered within himself all of this wisdom. That's how they explain the name Kohelas, one of the three names of King Solomon. But I want just for a moment to examine this verse a bit further, and it describes him as King of Jerusalem. Now, we know that King Solomon was king over the entire land of Israel, all of the cities, Tel Aviv, Haifa, Be'er Sheva, everywhere. He was king over the entire country. Why is he described as king of Jerusalem? So what the commentaries explain is that the prestige, the most significant, the most important city of Israel was Jerusalem. It was his capital city, and that's why King Solomon is referred to as king of Jerusalem, of course, he was king over all of Israel. Fascinating fact, just in terms of how the United States and foreign policy relates to what the capital of Israel is today. We don't have our embassy in Jerusalem. Our embassy is in Tel Aviv. They have a consulate in Jerusalem that American citizens could go to to get paperwork like passports and birth certificates and stuff like that, which I've been to on many occasions. But there is no embassy in Jerusalem. Do you know why not? Because if we were to put our embassy in Jerusalem, that would mean that we acknowledge in our foreign policy that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, which is a statement that the United States government is not willing to make because the Palestinians lay claim to Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, if someone is born in Jerusalem, three out of my four children were born in Jerusalem. It says it on their passports. But what does it say on their passports? It doesn't say born in Israel. If a child is born in Tel Aviv, if a child is born in Haifa, the passport will say born in Israel. When a child is born in Jerusalem, it states born in Jerusalem. That's what it says. I could bring, next time I'll bring my passports in just to show you so you believe me. Born in Jerusalem. Because to say born in Israel when a child is born in Jerusalem would be to officially acknowledge that Jerusalem is part of Israel, not part of Palestine. And our government is not willing to do that. So that's just interesting. And, and, and that is why the 
the words of Koheles of Ecclesiastes state that King Solomon was king over Jerusalem to make it firm, to make it clear that Jerusalem is the capital city of Israel. Which, by the way, Israel, where do they have their Knesset, which is their governing body? They have it in Jerusalem, because they see their own capital as Jerusalem. Let's take a look at the other two names of King Solomon. And that brings us to source two. I'll read it together with you in English. It says here that David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he came to her and he lay with her. She gave birth to a boy and he called his name Solomon. <coughs> Hashem loved him, meaning he loved this new baby. And he sent word through Nathan the prophet and called his name Yedidya because of Hashem. I'll give you the background, I'll give you the context upon which these verses appear. But before that, let's just translate the name Yedidya. What does it mean? In Hebrew, the word Yedid means a friend, a companion, somebody who you love, a beloved one to you. And the word Ka at the end means God. That's one of the names of God. The, the letters Yud and He spell the name of God. And what God is sending through the word of his prophet Nathan is, Go please and tell David I'm going to name this child the beloved one of God. I'm going to have a special relationship with this child. In what context is this child born? And I believe we've discussed in the past the episode, it wasn't a bright episode, it was the episode of David and Bathsheba, where there was a woman named Bathsheba. She had a husband, and David sent her husband off to war. He was killed in battle. And David took his wife, Bathsheba, as his own wife. And that was considered to be something sinful. The, the prophet Nathan comes and rebukes David. David right away, by the way, acknowledges his mistake. He says, I have sinned, and God forgives him. In contrast to King Saul, who also wasn't a perfect king, and God sends the prophet Samuel to tell Saul what you did was incorrect, and how does Saul respond? I did nothing wrong. Saul can't retain his kingship. God says, I'm going to divest you of your monarchy. We're going to pass it on to someone else. What David did perhaps was worse. But because he's able to own it, he takes responsibility right away, God says, you will remain the king of the Jewish people and the dynasty of kings will continue to run through you. So that's just a lesson, by the way. In life, we can't be expected to be perfect people. To be human is to be flawed. But how do we deal with the things that we do wrong determines who we are. In the aftermath of the episode of Bathsheba, she became pregnant from their union, which was seen as a sinful union. And God sends a message to David saying, this child is going to become very ill. The child who's going to be born will be very ill. As part of divine retribution for what you've done wrong by sleeping with Bathsheba. And the child is born, and indeed the child takes ill, very seriously ill. And King David is distraught. He starts to fast. He refuses to eat or to drink. He lies on the floor, and he is fasting. He's praying. He's trying to repent, trying to save the life of his child. All of his servants say, King, please get up. Eat something. You can't go on like this for, for, you know, for this long. It was a week, almost a week. And finally, the child passes. He dies. And the servants, they don't know how to break the news to King David. Who's going to tell him? Look how upset he was while the child was still alive but ill. Finally, the king sees them whispering around him, and they know, he knows, he realizes that the child passed. Upon which he gets up from the floor, he washes himself, he eats and he drinks, and they say to King David, I don't understand. While the child was still alive, you had this intense level of mourning. Now that the child is no longer alive, how is it that you get up and you eat and you drink? And he answers and he says, this is a powerful lesson, my friends. He says that all the while that the child was alive, there was hope. So long as there was hope, I never gave up. I thought perhaps I could pray, I could entreat, I could fast, I could repent, I could try to avert the catastrophe from reaching its result. Once the child is no longer alive, there's nothing I can do. I can't change the past. The past is done. I can't bring the child back to life. Life has to go on past tragedy. But his wife, who now was married to him legally and rightfully, Bathsheba, was hesitant to have another child. She says to David, look what happened to our first child. The baby died. And King David says to her, I am confident that my repentance was accepted. We now have noble intent. I am sure that if we have another child, he won't meet the same fate as the first. And they have this child. And that's these verses that we just read. It says that King David comforted his wife. What's he comforting her from? The loss of their baby. And now she agrees to be with him again, to try to have another one to replace the first. And they're successful. 
and they have the baby. And she names him Solomon. That's the name that she gives to the child. Because we believe, friends, that Jewish thought teaches that parents, when they name a child, there's a spark of divine inspiration. Sometimes we choose a name. That will often define the personality of the child. A Hebrew name is an incredible thing. And Sam, that's why I'm so glad that you just got one. So congratulations, Mazel Tov, to you. There's something very deep in a Jewish name. For example, my oldest daughter. I spoke of my four-year-old son, who's quite the handful. He's got a lot of energy, which hopefully we'll be able to channel in good directions. But my oldest, she's a daughter. She's 12. Her name is Tova, which in Hebrew means good. And from the day she was born, she was just good. It's amazing, you know, like this perfect smile, her social etiquette, everything she does is good. There's a level of divine inspiration that goes into the name. And therefore, Bathsheba unwittingly, but perhaps with a divine inspiration, names her son Shlomo, Solomon, which is closely related to the Hebrew word Shalom, peace. Because during the reign of King Solomon, the Jewish people experienced peace, serenity, tranquility, like never before. The prophets describe how each person lived in their home with a beautiful backyard with grapevines growing, wine was flowing, there was prosperity and peace. She names her son Solomon. But God sends his prophet Nathan and said, I have another name for this child. Because this child is the icon, is the symbol that even when we've done things wrong, we could write them, we could fix them. David did something wrong with Bathsheba, but that's not going to remain a permanent smirch on his record. He's able to fix that. I'm going to have a special bond of love with this child. I'm going to name him the beloved one of God, Yadid Yah. And that's why this name to me is always, if you say, what's your favorite Hebrew name that you could choose for a male, for a boy, it would be Yadid Yah. Because that to me is a symbol of the fact that things in the past are not permanent. We have the ability to fix things. We could always right the wrongs and move on and forge a new future. That's symbolized in this third name of King Solomon, Yadid Yah, the beloved of God. That was the message being given to King David and his wife Bathsheba through this son. Okay, now the following fact may shock you and may seem very strange. But I'll tell you, I was just having a conversation with a fellow last night who's from Azerbaijan, which is somewhere near Russia. And he said that girls in his hometown, and they still do this, get married at a very young age. The age I'm about to quote to you will shock you, so hold on to your chairs, ladies and gentlemen. They get married at the age of 15 years old. And like, we're looking at him like, whoa. <laughs> you know, like, and he said that you know, in Western society, we don't get that. But he said that in his culture, things were different. You have responsibilities as a child. Growing up, when you're 15 years old, you will be caring for your eight other younger siblings, and you have certain skills, and people are more mature. Perhaps the life expectancies there are, are, are less than they are here in the United States. You have a shorter time to live, so you've got to get an earlier start. I'm not in any way advocating marriage at 15. Please don't take it that way. I'm just explaining the way he explained his culture. So how old was King Solomon when he became king over the Jewish people? When his father David passed and the throne was handed to him, how old was he? He was a mere lad of 12 years old. And he became the wisest person at this young age. He reigned for 40 years. That's how long he was king for, which is the identical number for how long his father, King David, was king over the Jewish people. 40 years. He was king of the Jewish people. And let's move now to source three. This is the history of how King Solomon got his wisdom. Page two, source three. This is a quote from the book of Kings, Sefer Melachim. And it says that at a place called Gibbon, God appeared to Solomon in a dream, and God said, Ask, what shall I give you? Imagine the famous genie in the lamp pops out and says, I shall grant your any request. And that's what Solomon has in this dream. But it's not a genie, it's God, and it's real. Anything he asks for could be his. What would we ask for? You know, they come and say, Anything you want, we'll give to you. What does he ask for? Solomon asks for the following. He says, Please give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this, your difficult people? Solomon says, I'm king. What do I need? What attribute, what talent and skills do I need to be a good king? I need an understanding heart. Because in the olden days, whenever there would be disputes between people that could not be resolved by the local courts, 
the matter would finally reach the king and the king would adjudicate. He would be the one to decide who was right and who was wrong. And Solomon is saying, to be a good king, I feel that I need an incredible dose of wisdom. And how does God respond to this request? Let's scroll down a few more lines. And God said to him, because you have requested this thing, and you have not requested length of days. Or he could have said, I want to live to 120. He could have asked for that. You have not requested riches, right? Kings, monarchs of, of years ago were power hungry. They wanted wealth and riches. So he doesn't ask for that. You have not requested the life of your enemies. I'm sure kings, if they could have hostile neighbors around there, they would ask for nothing other than to please deliverance of their enemies. He doesn't ask for that either. But you have requested understanding to comprehend justice. Behold, says God, I have acted in accordance with your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and understanding heart, such that there has never been anyone like you before, nor will anyone like you ever arise. You are going to be the smartest man who ever lived and who ever will live. Furthermore, now here's, the, here's the kicker. This is the punchline. God says, you ask for one thing, not only will I give that to you. Furthermore, even that which you did not request, I have granted you, even riches and honor all your days such that there has never been any man among the kings like you. Solomon asks for wisdom. He shuns length of days, power, riches, his enemies being delivered. But God says, because you made the correct request, you saw what was truly valuable, I will give you everything else also. I will give you wealth. I will give you honor and prestige. Everything. You ask for wisdom, you're getting it all. It's a matter of fact, the Midrashim tell us, that King Solomon was e even able to understand the conversation between animals. He knew what they were saying. Could you imagine if you could know what your dog was telling you? Imagine that, you know? King Solomon was able to discern the language of animals. He knew how they communicated with one another. Another interesting point was that when King Solomon received this incredible gift of wisdom, he made a feast, he made a party, a celebration. And that is the source. We have a custom. Sometimes when we complete perhaps a section of the Talmud or an order in the Mishnah, we make a party. It's called a siyum. We invite our friends and our loved ones, and we celebrate that accomplishment. And that is the source of making the celebratory party upon completion of a portion of wisdom is King Solomon's party that he made. Excellent. Let's take a look at an analogy that the Midrash uses to explain King Solomon's request and the gift that God gave him. The Midrash in Source 4 tells us this could be compared to a king who wished to reward him in Source 4 on page 2. He wished to reward his confidant and asked him to choose whatever he would like. What should he choose? If I ask for gold and silver, says the confidant to himself, the king will surely give it to me. If I ask for beautiful garments, the king will give them to me. Just as an aside, by the way, the importance of garments, of clothing, of the ancient society. You know, we, we take it for granted. We have a closet full of clothes. I believe there are many women, perhaps even men, who will open up their closet and it's so tightly packed that you can't even fit your finger in between the hangers and they will say, I have nothing to wear. You know? <laughs> My wife does not say that. That's not where I heard it. And in the olden days, you know, people had one set of clothes, if they were wealthy, they had a backup, so when they washed one set, they could have something on them when they were you know, washing it. Clothes were a commodity. They weren't able to mass produce them. It was something which people really appreciated. And that's why you'll see beautiful garments here right up in the list with gold and silver, because in those days, it was perhaps seen as precious as gold and silver. So he says, if I ask for gold and silver, the king will give it to me. If I ask for beautiful garments, I would get those too. If I ask for a luxurious palace, somewhere in the Hamptons, I'm sure, the king will give that to me also. I will ask, says the confidant, for one thing which is more precious than any of these. One thing which will assure me of gold, silver, clothing, a palace, everything the king has to offer. And what does he ask for? Whereupon the servant asks for the hand of the princess in marriage. Says the Midrash, and so did Solomon, rather than ask for wealth, power, or glory, he asked for one thing more precious than any of them. One thing that included them all. He asked for wisdom. For he who has wisdom gains everything. Beautiful analogy of the Midrash. But friends, I have a question for you. Perhaps two questions. Question number one. The way the Midrash seems to present it, 
the confidant is a wise man, he's wily, he's clever. And the whole thing is a ploy. He says, how can I get everything? You know, well, if I ask for the princess's hand in marriage, chances are the king will want her to live in a beautiful palace. He's going to want her to have beautiful clothing. He's going to want her to have a good, big, fat bank account, right? It's a ploy. It's a gimmick. If the whole thing is a gimmick, and that's the analogy to King Solomon, that King Solomon asks for wisdom and the hope and the ploy that he'll get everything else also, then why is it so commendable? Why is it so admirable that God says, wow, you asked for wisdom. Amazing, right? It's a gimmick. That's question number one. Question number two. Perhaps ploys and gimmicks will help us to deceive and trick and maneuver and manipulate a king of flesh and blood, but God who sees into our heart of hearts. We can't trick him. He knows us better than we know ourselves. Is it possible to trick God into giving you everything? How do we understand this analogy given to us in the Midrash to explain King Solomon? And this is amazing. This is incredible. It's so, so deep. I saw this quoted from one of the Hasidic masters known as the Sfas Ms. He lived, I believe, in the 17, early 1800s. And he says, let's take a look for a moment at this confidant, at this servant of the king. The king says, ask for something and I'll grant your request. It's his moment. He asks, what does he ask for? The princess's hand in marriage. When he asks for that, he stands to lose everything. The king may say, how dare you, you know? Every, every father, you know, no one's good enough for their daughter, right? And when you speak about the king, you know, he was, you have the chutzpah, great, right? That's a Hebrew word that made its way into the English dictionary, chutzpah, right? You have the chutzpah, the audacity and temerity to ask for my daughter's hand in marriage? Perhaps he won't get anything. Perhaps he'll be given a trip to the gallows. Risky business, very risky. As a matter of fact, our sages tell us, and there's a great Talmudic adage, and I believe I quoted it here as source five on page three. It says in the Talmud, I'll read it to you first in Hebrew, Tofasto miruba lo tofasto, tofasto muat tofasto, which means if you try to grab too much, sometimes when you shoot too high, you ask for take my four-year-old to the supermarket, and I say, you can get a treat. And he picks this sucking candy, this sucker that's about the size of his head. I'll say, you know what? I've just been discouraged. I offer off the table. That, that could happen sometimes. You ask for too much, you end up with nothing. If you try to get a little bit, you'll end up with something, with something significant. That's a saying from the Talmud, words of wisdom from our sages. But when you apply that idea to this servant, He's shooting for the stars. He's asking for the princess's hand in marriage. He may lose everything. How could he do that? It sounds like utter foolishness. Ask for something small. Ask for rich as gold. At least you'll have that. But friends, you know where it would make sense for him to ask for that? Perhaps he loves her so much that the thought of having gold or riches, garments or a palace without her is worthless. Perhaps he loves her so much, his love is so intense and strong, that life without her seems to be worthless. Well, then it makes sense to ask for her, because if I only get gold, I have nothing. If I have a palace to live in, but she's not in it with me, what's life worth living? That's when it makes sense for the servant to ask for the princess's hand in marriage. That's how King Solomon felt about wisdom. He was one of the wealthiest men to ever live. He knew what riches were, but what does he say about riches? He says, hmm. Futile of futility is always futile. He doesn't give them much value. He knew what power was. He was a very powerful king with alliances, international alliances, all around the Middle East. But he said, no, that's not worth too much either. He knew that wisdom is key. Life without wisdom. If you have a very large bank account, but you don't use it correctly, that could be a very detrimental thing. As a matter of fact, I quote that as source number seven on our, on our source sheet. I'll get back to source six in a moment, but source seven says, there's a sickening evil, says King Solomon, which I have seen under the sun, riches hoarded by their owner to his misfortune. Sometimes people can have wealth, and that could corrupt them. As a matter of fact, one of the great biblical personalities, great not because he was a good person, but because he was famous, was someone who started a rebellion against Moshe, against Moses. And we sometimes say, if only we would have leaders like that, we would comply, we would listen. 
Even Moses had dissenters during his era, right? And there was a man named Korah, and Korah started a rebellion. And our sages teach us it's because he was so wealthy that it gave him these ambitions that were incorrect ambitions. They were the source of his ruin. A person can sometimes have wealth. I, I don't need to tell you that. Haven't there been families where there was a large amount of money and now there's an inheritance? What does that do to the family sometimes? It rips it apart. Sometimes wealth can be a very negative thing. It's the wisdom of how to use it correctly that King Solomon saw as valuable. If all you have is power, but you abuse it, do you have a good thing? If all you have is beautiful clothes, but you just use them to flaunt what you have, make others jealous, are clothes a good thing? King Solomon knew that all of these things without the wisdom of how to use them correctly are worthless. And therefore he asked, just as the confidant asks for the princess's hand in marriage, for life to him without her means nothing, Life to Solomon without wisdom meant nothing, and therefore he shoots for the stars. He says, please give me wisdom. God says, excellent. Now you'll have the capability, the wherewithal for how to use all of these amazing qualities, wealth, garments, a palace. Now I'll give everything to you because now you have the knowledge for how to use that correctly. If we may just for a few moments explore one of these verses at source 6 where King Solomon says that some of the material mundane things that we have in this world are futile. It's a depressing verse when you take it at face value, but let's explore. Let, let, let's get to the bottom of it. And King Solomon here says, source this is Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2. Futility of futilities, said Coelus. Futility of futilities, all is futile. Wow, that's depressing. <laughs> so, let's explore. First of all, the commentaries note that that word heaven, in Hebrew is hevel, which means futile, it's used seven times in the verse. It's used seven times. That's if you count the plural, futilities, or havalim, as two. And what King Solomon is saying is that the number seven, which I'm sure, as you know, is symbolic of the physical world in which we live. There are seven days in the week, there are seven continents upon the globe, and there are seven notes in the musical spectrum. So great, grateful for the uh, sound of music, that song that helps me remember the uh, seven musical notes, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, right? Julie Andrews was the actress, correct? Excellent. So, what he's saying is, Julia Andrews or Julie? Julie. Julie, Julie good. Um, what, what he's saying is, is that this number seven, representing the mundane, the physical world, the material world, that in it of itself, that's an end unto itself without just being the means for something else, that's futile. Imagine somebody who works hard all day to be able to have enough money to live. And they have enough money to live to be able to work hard all day. And that is their chain of existence. I work to eat and I eat to live and I work to eat and I eat to live and I do that every day in and day out. What do I have in life? If there's a deeper meaning, if there's a calling beyond that, that's not futile. But what King Solomon is saying is the material world in it and of itself is futile. It's a great story. And it's actually a, uh, a parable. There's a story told of a king. And this was a king who was brought in by a country. And every two years, they would bring in an outsider, a foreigner, to serve as king of their country. And they would play a little trick on the king. They would bring in the king, and they would say, now you are our king, you are our leader, we'll pay taxes to you. But what they wouldn't tell the king was that at the end of two years, he would be forcibly removed from his throne cast outside the walls of this country and not allowed back in. No king ever found that out. And what the king would do is he would amass storehouses of wealth for himself. He would tax the people and try to collect as much money as possible. Coins of silver and gold filling storehouses. But when the two years were up, the king without warning would be clutched by the guards on either side and escorted forcefully outside of the confines of the city walls unable to take with him anything that he amassed and accrued over the years of his kingship. One time they brought in a king and this king was a bit different. He was a king who was kind. He was a king who was in it for the people. He was the servant leader of which the leadership books speak about. He was there to help the people. And one person in the kingdom took a liking to this king and says, I better tell him about our secret. I better tell him what's going to happen at the close of the two years. And he tells the king the secret. And the king then 
puts away a modest amount of money outside the city. If the king is entitled to wages too, it's not an easy job. I always tell people, I would not want to be president of the United States of America because it's not an easy job. It's hard. When you're the one making the final, imagine just for a second, I'm going to digress. Imagine there's a plane up in the sky, Flight 93, and you need to make a call. There were three planes that were hijacked earlier that day. Two crashed into the Twin Towers, one into the Pentagon. And there's one more plane now which had been commandeered by terrorists with 150 passengers sitting on board. And you need to give the executive order to send up the F-16s and shoot it down and kill 150 people on board who are missing. It's not an easy job. Perhaps that's the correct decision because the people are going to be killed either way. Because if they're not hit by a missile from an F-16, they'll get flown into a populated area and they'll die with many others. But I wouldn't want to have to make that job, that call, that decision. So a king is entitled to wages. It's a hard job. And this king, a good man who loved the people, put away modest wages for himself outside of the city walls. And when finally his day came at the end of two years and he was forced out of the city, he had a retirement plan. He had money put away in a fund that he was able to live off for the rest of his life. And this story is really a uh, metaphor for our lives here in this world. That we're, we spend so much time amassing, trying to gather as much stuff as we can get our hands on. Piling, stockpiles full of coins and gold. But the moment will come that perhaps with warning, I hope with warning, perhaps without warning, the moment will come when we will be escorted outside of this world. And whatever we put away for us in a storehouse that's safe, that can never be taken from us, that will be ours. That's not futile. That has a purpose. That has meaning. Only within the physical, within the mundane, within the seven, beyond that is something which is eternal. So I, I was fortunate to spend many years living in Israel. I got married. My wife and I built our family in Israel. That's why there are three out of my four children where Jerusalem is stamped on their passport as place of birth. And we had family who lived in Israel together with us. My wife has a sister who spent a few years in Israel, and now she lives in Cincinnati, Ohio. We actually spent Thanksgiving weekend together with them in Cincinnati. It was a beautiful trip. Cincinnati is on the southern border of Ohio and Kentucky. And there's actually a bridge you could walk across to go from Ohio to Kentucky going across the Ohio River, which was the line of demarcation during the Civil War between the North and the South. So my kids see the bridge and they say, we want to go for a walk over the bridge. So Friday afternoon, right before Shabbat, we take a walk across the Ohio River. I stepped foot in Kentucky. I said, okay, I was now in Kentucky, back home to Cincinnati. <laughs> this family, my wife's sister and her husband, lived in Israel. And the day came when they decided they wanted to move back to the United States. It was a great beginning of their family, and their time had come. But they wanted to move back to America. And they made a moving sale. They were going to sell some of the things that they had bought in Israel. They couldn't fit back on their lift on the boat to the United States. And they said to me, you know, come on by. Maybe there are some things that you want. You know, for you, we'll give a special deal. You know, I wasn't looking for a deal. We were sad that they were leaving. And I walked through their home and piled up on their kitchen table, on their counters, on the dining room table. It was just so much stuff. And I was looking at the stuff, and the stuff had price tags on them, being sold in the new Israeli shekel, 20 shekel, 50 shekel, 100 shekel. I'm looking at a salad bowl that said 50 shekel on it. And I remembered the story behind that salad bowl. My brother-in-law bought it for his wife as a gift one year for Hanukkah. And I remember how happy they were when they got it. Now it's got a price tag saying 50 shekel. They can't take it back home with them. They've got to give it up. And I was walking through the apartment looking at the items, becoming more and more depressed. I'm not exaggerating. When I came home that night, I could not sleep. I was depressed. Because I was saying we spent so much of our lives dedicated to just getting stuff and more stuff. And we're going shopping and we're getting this and we're getting that. And the same way they can't take it with them to the United States, we can't take anything with us either. But perhaps the following is the comforting thought. I don't want to leave you on a depressed note, certainly not, not on a great day. If it was sunny outside, maybe I would. <laughs> I thought to myself, how many salads did she serve in that salad bowl? She would frequently have guests over at her Shabbat table. She's an incredibly creative cook. I can't name or pronounce for that matter most of the dishes that she makes. And she makes these beautiful, colorful salads. 
that would make any vegetarian or vegan really, really happy. Same as that for you. And um, how many people benefited? Did she give a great Shabbat dinner with those salad bowls? So it's true, their time has come. You can't take them with you. But how do you use it for your duration here? What do you do with it? And that's what gives it meaning. That's what infuses it with value. And it's not so sad anymore. We realize it's true. We have a finite amount of years that we could use these things. But it's not futile. Do you know why? Because when we do something meaningful with it, that gives it true meaning. And that's the message here from King Solomon. One more note is the following. If someone is going to tell you, you know, riches, wealth, eh, it's not really worth anything, you know? If somebody who doesn't have it tells you that, you'll be like, well, what does he know about wealth and riches, you know? Give me some and then we'll see, right? You, you don't want to listen to what they have to say about it. What do they know? King Solomon was an incredibly wealthy man. The prophets tell us just the size of the dinners that he would have. He would invite hundreds of people to his dinner table every night. They would go through huge amounts of flour, fine flour. They were not vegan. They also ate some meat. There were a lot of meat going on over there, too. And it just describes the incredible indulgence by which King Solomon lived and shared with others. So he had wealth. He had riches. And if he tells you that wealth by itself is meaningless, then you could hear it from him. I'll share something with you about my wife. She's amazing, first of all. Second of all, they one time asked her to give a class to seventh grade girls about the value of modesty. Within the Jewish observant Orthodox world, modesty is still a, an important value. And they asked her to please give a class of modesty. I was actually just, um, Monday night, we did a little movie night in my house, and the entire family, all six of us, piled onto the couch with popcorn. And we were watching the 19, I think it was in 1967, the Swiss Family Robinson put out by Disney. And I remember watching when I was a kid, I wanted my children to see it. And I was noticing just the dress, the style of dress going back that far. People don't dress like that in movies anymore. I was just looking, you know, how modest everyone was dressed. It was, it was, it was remarkable. So we were watching this movie together, but they asked my wife, to come give a class about modesty. And she comes into the classroom with the seventh grade girls and she says to the girls, when you meet somebody, when you encounter someone, people are complex, they're multi-layered, there's many, many facets to their personality. What do you notice about them? And there was a list of things that the girls would raise their hands and they would share what they noticed about people. Some said their personality. Some said they have a good sense of humor. Some said the fact that this person is creative. The person's a good artist. You know, different people have different skills. Um, I am not an artist. It is, it's an area where I am completely deficient. As a matter of fact, I taught high school for a year, and uh, I got on very well with the students, and it was a good year. But my hardest moment of teaching high school is when the principal came over to me and said, we have open house tomorrow. Many parents are going to come see the school. Could you please artistically decorate your classroom? I was like, no, <laughs> I can't do that. That's not me. So everyone has different facets, talents, and things. Some people are very creative, compassionate, kind, you name it. And by the time the girls in the class finish contributing to the different components they see in a person when they meet them, the blackboard, or these days the smart board, was full. was full of different adjectives describing components of a person. Then my wife said, okay, when you dress in a way which is extremely immodest, and people meet you, she takes the eraser and she starts to erase, and the only thing left on the board was the word either body or appearance. That was the only thing left on the board. And that was the way, which I thought was very creative, how to teach the girls the importance of modesty. If you want people to see beyond the way you look, if you dress in a modest way, you have a much better chance of accomplishing that. But the reason why I tell you this story is because if you want someone to go into a classroom and teach people about modesty, not only girls, boys, modesty is not only the way you dress, it's in the way you talk, it's in the way you act. Who are you going to send in to do that? If you send in somebody who their, their shirt does not match their pants and they're wearing two colored socks and they look like they're, they have tomato stains on their shirt from last night's dinner, people will say, well, what does he know about the challenge or she know about the challenge of dressing in style? Their style is from four decades ago. They don't experience the same challenges that we do. And that's why I was very happy they sent in my wife because she, she dresses very style. She actually dresses me as well. Don't tell anyone that secret. But someone once asked me, said, wow, that's a beautiful sweater. What company is it? And I'm scratching. It's the company that my wife said, pick that. That's the name of the company. It's, it's the wife said, pick that company. 
And I, I was wearing the sweater, and I came home that evening, and I said, you know, to my wife, "What company is this sweater that I'm wearing?" You know, <laughs> turns out it was Zara's. But um, she has a great sense of style, but she has an appreciation of modesty in, 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 in the same time. And someone who tells you about modesty when they understand and they appreciate style, you could hear it from them. And King Solomon was the same way when it came to wealth. He had it. He knew what it was all about. And yet he was able to tell you that if you take wealth on its own, it's not, it's not an end in and of itself. It's a means towards other things. By itself, he says that it's just futile. Let's cover one or two more ideas, and then we will uh, call it a day. We're going to skip a bit. Now let us skip to page number five, source alignment. Again, what I hope to gain from this verse is an understanding of the values of King Solomon. When you sometimes want to understand a person, if you read the things that they have written, it will give you insight into who they are. And this is the closing verse. This is the final verse in the book of Ecclesiastes. And King Solomon says the following. He says, the sum of the matter... When all has been considered, fear God and keep his commandments, for that is man's whole duty. Important saying. Basically, at the end of the day, realize that what's important in life is to be a good, moral, God-fearing person. Everything else will fall into place once you have that. And I would like to just take for a moment to analyze this word that's used to describe man, Adam. Adam means man, Adam. The first of all men was named Adam and that became the name for mankind. But there are several other ways that we could use to refer to man. We could say ish, that's another way to say man, and we could also use the word gever. I was teaching uh, high school students some Hebrew words, I said, gentlemen and ladies, the most important words you need to know in Hebrew are the words givarim and nashim. And those are the words that you would find on the outside of a restroom, because one of the most embarrassing experiences, and I can tell you this from first hand, that you could ever experience in life is walking into the wrong, to the wrong one. So I said, this is an important, these are an important set of words you need to know. It chooses the word Adam to refer to man. Why so? And a great Jewish thinker, a rabbi by the name of the Maharal, he notes that the word Adam is derived from the word Adama, which means the ground. And just like the ground has all kinds of Capabilities. It has minerals and nutrients that are contained within its soil. But if you leave it at that, nothing will ever come from it. You need to grow things. You have to plant things. And then you can tap in to the hidden reservoirs of nutrients and capabilities contained within the soil. When you speak of man, his journey, his mission in this world, you notice that out of all the beings that exist in the world, humans are the ones who are born most imperfect. Angels are created perfect. Animals? are pretty capable. Animals are able to walk pretty much the day that they are delivered, the day that they're born. They have to grow in size a little bit, but they're pretty, they're, they are far ahead of where a human baby, a human baby is born absolutely helpless. Can't eat himself, can't do anything for himself. And that's because a human is capable of, of attaining and achieving the most. And the idea here is, is that the purpose of life, just like we understand physically, the purpose of life is to cultivate and to tap into all of our talents and resources. Physically, we have to develop those. We also have to develop our personality. We're born flawed. We are born probably uh, very selfish people, and then we expand, and we care about other people. We find a spouse, and we have children, and we learn what it means to take on the responsibility of helping others. And that's why he uses the word Adam in this verse, where it speaks of the journey of man, because just like the earth is full of capability, but it needs to be cultivated, people as well, the Adam, when you speak about the journey of man and the, the, the goals that we have in this world, they need to be tapped into, they have to be cultivated. I'm going to close with an idea, a short idea, from the great Jewish rabbi known as Nachmanides, and he wrote an essay on the book of Ecclesiastes. And he says that if you look at life, life could be compared to the action of taking two stones, two rocks, and rubbing them together. Sometimes a little spark will come flying out from those two stones. The spark could flash a little light and then go out, and it would be as if that spark never existed. But a spark also has the potential to ignite a fire. And that fire could spread. It could become a blazing inferno, something incredible, something which will impact so many. And he says that is an analogy for life. We could live and we could die. It could be as if we never lived in this world. But the impact that we have the potential to make in this world, and we think about some great people, 
what they accomplished in their lives, how their legacy lives on, they have the potential to take that spark and make it come alive. Thank you very much.